Welcome to The Homeless Conservative. I'm your host, Blake Fisher. I'm a political junkie so that you don't have to be. And we've got a lot of newsy stuff to talk about on this week's show. We're going to talk about the dead on arrival border deal. We're going to talk about our retaliation towards Iran proxies for uh, attacking and killing three U.S. soldiers. And we're going to talk about Trump not having immunity in his federal prosecution case. The, the you know Just to kind of level set some stuff, in a 24-hour news cycle... A lot of the stuff that ends up being talked about doesn't matter, and I don't think it's worth paying attention to. And one of my goals on this podcast is to only filter out filter out the stuff that I don't think matters, and I realize I'm going to be wrong about that sometimes. I'm making a judgment call. But so much stuff that happens in the news because we've got a 24-hour news cycle that has to be filled, it's a bunch of stuff that doesn't really matter, or we don't have all the information yet, and maybe the information that we get a day later, a week later, a month later will make it complete, and then it's worth paying attention to, but otherwise, it's just a lot of speculation, and so I, I'm trying to skip that kind of stuff. I don't really just want to talk about the news of the day, because I don't think that most of the time that matters, so just to let you in on my filter, my filter is generally, do I think this is going to matter 30 days from now? And not just matter, but do I think I have enough information to talk about it in a way that you would be informed 30 days from now if you don't have any new information? So on all three of these things, they're very newsy things that happened this week, but I think they're really important. I think they're going to continue to be important for way longer than 30 days from now. And so that's the kind of thing I will talk about in a newsy sense. And so just to give you an idea of like what you're getting from this is, is often I'm going to kind of play a little filtering because I love to read this kind of stuff. But a lot of times I just kind of go, okay, that's great to know, but I don't think anyone that's not a political junkie needs to know that or that's paying attention to every little development because your job as a citizen of this country, primarily, first of all, one thing is to vote for your elected officials, right? And so you need to have that information at the time that you vote. And really, you don't need it other than that. But... I don't think you should only pay attention to the news every two years or four years or however long between elections. I mean, I was I was thinking federally, like Congress and Senate and president, but obviously you've got local ones too. I'm not covering your local politics. Sorry, you're going to have to get your local school board information from somewhere else. That's fine. And so the, the, you know, the idea is that I think you should have stay up to date with this stuff because I think when it comes time to voting, it's good to go like, all right, yeah, I remember that happened and I remember this happened and I remember feeling negatively about that person multiple times over the last couple of years. And so I think this kind of stuff is important. So I'm going to get a little more newsy today and I hope you like it. Let me know if you don't, though. Shoot me an email uh, at Blake at thehomelessconservative.com or on any of the social media stuff. Feel free to jump in the comments with the the rest of the MAGA people that hate me. It's totally fine. Be, be a voice of reason in there. Don't start arguing with them, though. Don't feed the trolls. You can argue with me, but I just stay away from the Trump 2024 people. Um, not to say that everyone voting for Trump is an idiot, but the people commenting Trump 2024, yeah, you know. Um, okay, so let's talk about the border deal first because I think it's it's of importance. So we, if you haven't heard, I'll catch you up just a little bit. So we we have um, a situation where the Democrats in Congress, for some reason, this is flipped, and the Democrats are now sort of what people would call traditionally hawkish in the sense that they are wanting to fund. Uh, and by fund, really, it's more about giving weapons to Ukraine in their fight against Russia, whereas the GOP is kind of split on the issue. But a lot of people have followed in Trump's kind of line of uh, we should stay out of other people's business and that like Russia is not the <laughs> aggressor here, which I think is a ridiculous notion. I'm certainly on the side of Ukraine. Now, we can talk about what how we should support Ukraine. I think we absolutely should, though. I think that it's it's insane to me that we're talking about like just leaving that area where Russia has made clear that it's its goal is not to stop in Ukraine. It you know Ukraine borders Poland, which is a NATO country, and if a NATO country is attacked, we got to send troops. A lot of people forget that what happened on September 11th is that we were attacked. Now not you know NATO is set up where it was thinking foreign countries, you know, countries would attack other countries. And the whole point of NATO was, hey, if you're attacked, we've all got your back and we will fight with you, essentially. 
So 9-11 was kind of a weird one because, well, you know, obviously Al-Qaeda, not a country, but we were obviously attacked. So that's why we had British shoulder, soldiers and French and German and these other NATO allies with us in Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, actually, Afghanistan mostly because Iraq was um, a little trickier. But the point is, we absolutely benefited from NATO. So when Trump tells you that we've never gotten anything from NATO, we are the NATO country that got that has been attacked in the last 20 years. It actually has not happened to the other countries that have they've not gone to war with someone where we had to have their back. But this is a situation where right now we can give Ukraine mostly weapons is what we're doing. So most of the money that we have given to Ukraine is really given to United States defense contractor. Yeah, sorry, United States defense contractors so they can build weapons and we can send those to Ukraine. There is some also money that's involved. But to me, it makes sense that we should spend money and send weapons to Ukraine to push back on Russia's in, uh, invasion of their country for a couple of reasons. One, it's the right thing to do. Two, it weakens Russia. So Russia's having to like get bogged down in this war that seems to really have no end in sight. And so one of our geopolitical em enemies is kind of bogged down and we don't have to send any troops over. I think that sounds like a good deal. Other people, reasonable people think that's not the case. Either way, Republicans control the House of Representatives. And so they said, look, if you want, if you want Ukraine funding, you're going to have to give us some border security and border funding for the crisis that's going on on our southern border. And I think that's a fair political play. So they really had Democrats and Biden right where they want them because Biden is really the cause of all the problems at the border. He's the one that signaled that it would be open, essentially. And that's the flood of migrants that happened after he took office. Trump really actually did clamp down on the border pretty well. Now, people on the left were claiming it was cruel and unusual and all these sort of things. But it certainly was within Trump's power. And it was within Biden's power to do the same things. But Biden is sort of pretending like his hands are tied and that all of this just happened to him. Um, it didn't. He absolutely has some control over this. So Biden said he's going to sign essentially a border deal because the politics on this have switched. So in, in an election year, all of a sudden, inflation was people's top priority as far as like the it, the issue that they cared about the most. That's now flipped. Immigration and the crisis at the border is kind of overtaking inflation as a top priority of voters in 2024. So Biden knows he's got to do something about this, and he's going to try to what he's trying to do is is say like, well, Congress passed this bill and I had to sign it. It was really Congress that enforced the border law so that he can kind of try to play nice with his fringe lefty part of the base that just wants open borders. But this is a lot of politics. The reason I think it's gross that it is politics is because, you know, these are real people and this is a real crisis. This is really affecting a lot of people, millions of people in lots of cities and lots of towns and border towns and even now blue cities as we bust those migrants to these sanctuary cities that claim they want a safe place for migrants. But all of a sudden they're overwhelmed, too. And somewhere like, you know, New York City Mayor Eric Adams has said that, you know, uh, this might be the end of New York. Like we cannot handle this, and and so, so it's all of a sudden it's an, it's an issue on both Democrats and Republicans' mind, and something that needs to get taken care of. So Republicans said, okay, we can do this. So there was this basically bipartisan deal that was being made in the Senate. James Langford, my senator, actually from Oklahoma, was one of the people, sort of architects of this bill, and before. Any of the details were even released. Trump and some of that crew were like, no, we should absolutely be opposed to this. We shouldn't even take a vote on it because, and he kind of said the quiet part out loud, essentially he wants the albatross of the border crisis around Biden's neck for him to get the blame for it. He doesn't want Biden to get any credit for fixing anything in 2024, a few months ahead of the November election, which again is playing politics with people's lives and an actual big issue. And an issue we've not even touched for decades. You know, the last, the last even attempt at border stuff we had. You know, some stuff in the twenty, in the two thousands and twenty tens, the sort of Gang of Eight stuff that went on in the Senate and never got anywhere. And so we've not had, we've had no immigration or border security stuff happen for a long time because previously every sort of border deal was hinged on. Democrats wanted some 
amnesty for people that had come here illegally. They either wanted it for like the children and the the dreamers, so called, that are kids of adults that came here illegally. But I mean, they came in their kids; they didn't have any agency over doing that themselves. Or you know, certain illegal aliens, or you know, basically there was all these situations where Democrats wanted some sort of amnesty to go along with it, whereas Republicans generally wanted more border security and enforcement. This is a situation where Democrats don't have a lot of bargaining power because their bargaining chip that they want is the Ukraine funding. And so that's the thing that's important to them. So anyway, we get this border deal and we finally get to see the text of it this last week, but it's basically dead on arrival because the the House leadership is saying they're not going to even take it up for a vote. Senate leadership is kind of saying the same thing. They're basically saying, hey, when this comes out, you can just vote against it. Uh, really all because Trump has said, eh, you know, we should vote against this. Now, I think there are some legitimate arguments um, against some of the stuff in the in the bill, and I'll talk about that for sure. But I think it's, I read an article that had a great point. It was like, if you showed someone this bill, and said, or, or at least gave them the, the bullet points of it and said, like, hey, you'll get this and this and this. Ten years ago, you would have thought Republicans controlled Congress, like, with super majorities and had a, a Republican in, in the White House. And, you know, you would have thought that, like, well, th- those are big wins. Um, but they're just getting written off as not good enough because Trump thinks, and some of the MAGA crowd, and some even just, like, more hardline conservatives – are saying we can get a better deal. Like if Trump gets elected, we're going to get a better deal than this. I think that's foolish because I don't think a you're guaranteed that Trump's going to win in November. If Trump doesn't win in November, there is zero chance you're going to get this good of a of a border bill uh, again with a Democratic president, and especially if Democrats take either the House or keep the Senate. Uh, secondly, not only does he have to win the White House for us to potentially wait another year for, by the way, something that we've been calling, we being people on the right, we've been calling a crisis and Democrats have been pretending it's not a crisis for the whole last couple of years. They just pretend, no, there's no crisis at the border. What are you talking about? We've had record millions. I mean, 300,000 people, I think, came in in December. I think that's the right number um, that we know of. That's just like that we had interactions with. Okay. And so there is a crisis. Democrats have been pretending it's not. But now that they see that the polls say that people think it's a crisis, they have to try to like go, uh, well, it's not really a crisis. But if, you know, Republicans fix this with if Congress can fix this, it's like something Biden can go. Well, that was Congress, not me. It's all silly politics stuff. But the, my point is that I think there's some stuff in this bill that like would be a really good step. I'm not saying it's the perfect immigration and border enforcement bill I've ever seen, uh, but what will ever be? Trump's not going to probably win. If he does win, he probably won't keep the House, the, which I think has a three-seat majority now for Republicans. And he certainly will not have a, a filibuster-proof 60 votes in the Senate. For sure. So he's not going to get a better deal than this. When when you when Trump tells you or Trump adjacent people tell you that the the perfect border deal will happen under him, that's just not true. Now, I will say this, Trump would enforce and did enforce the existing laws more, you know, aptly than than Biden has. Biden really has a lot of control that he's claiming he doesn't because Trump had this control. Now, some of it was a little tricky because like Title 42, which was a provision, was an emergency part of the pandemic specifically. So obviously there's no pandemic anymore to claim as an emergency, although Biden certainly tried for a really long time. And so I don't see how Trump's going to make this a lot better, although he would, I, I'm sure, would shut down parts of the border that Biden has relinquished or, you know, changed the policy on how we detain people or right now we're basically just catching and releasing people if they claim asylum. So let me, let's talk about what the bill actually does. So a few details. So there's no amnesty or legalization at all uh, for anyone already in the U.S. So that's a pretty big deal because Democrats, like I said, have always tried to use that as their bargaining chip is like, hey, we want some amnesty for some of those. I think it's now like I mean, it's tens of millions. It's it's like, I don't have the exact number. I know at one point it was definitely like 13 million illegal immigrants in the country, and I think it's more than that now. And so, like, the, whether they've claimed amnesty or not, and so there's no amnesty or legalization of any of those people that came in illegally, okay? So that's a pretty big deal. I think that's a, that, that'd be a, uh, that was a non-starter 
just a few years ago or even months ago, honestly, with Democrats. And so they're going to have to swallow that. So to me, that's a huge loss for Democrats. Um, Second, no asylum claim permitted for illegal crossers when there's a seven-day rolling average of 5,000 encounters per day or 8,500 in a single day. This is the part that got everyone hung up. They were like, why would we allow 5,000 people to enter every day before shutting down the border? And I think this is the biggest point of contention that I understand is because we don't have to allow anyone in. <laughs> like, it's our border. The people crossing it illegally or even coming to normal ports of entry, there is no legal requirement for us to accept them. Uh, now, there is, like said, like for, for an sort of amnesty for if you're fleeing your country or your city or wherever because you feel like your life is threatened. We've also increased that. Like right now, you could just basically say, I fear for my life. And right now, the Biden administration is going, all right, great. Hang out in the country while we wait for seven years or whatever it takes to get you into an immigration court for amnesty. And um, we just let them run around the country in the meantime. We're not, not tracking them very well. And so um, I get... I get why we don't like that. I think that's dangerous. We've we've seen um, uh, Border Patrol and Homeland Security have noted that there they've had encounters with hundreds of people that are on the terrorist watch list. We've, we're seeing people come across our southern border that are from Yemen and Syria and Iran and all these countries that like, wait a minute, that's not Venezuela or Chile or you're not fleeing drug violence in Central America. You are flying over to Central America and, and then coming up through our southern border because it's the easiest place to get into. That's a problem for me, and that's a safety thing, and I think that we've got to nip that for sure. I am I understand that most of the people coming across the border are just looking to make a better life for themselves, and I am fine with that, I, I but we've got a legal process for that. You can't skip the line ahead of the people that did the right thing. And so, um, but that 5,000 number, keep in mind, that's just encounters. That's not, an encounter might mean they go, ah, we caught you, get out of here. Uh, it doesn't mean you're arrested. It doesn't mean you were detained. It doesn't mean you were necessarily, like, it doesn't mean 5,000 people end up inside the country. It means they attempted to get into the country. And once we hit that number over a seven day rolling average, the border shuts down. We're not going to allow anyone in, whether they're claiming amnesty or not. Now, there's a lot of stuff between borders. I think, obviously, we need more enforcement of a border, like, between checkpoints. Obviously, we have some problems. I think there are some parts where a wall would help, some parts where it would not. We certainly do not need a wall across our entire southern border. It would not help in most places. But there are some places, I think it's, like, the one thing I read, pretty smart guy, he estimated that, like, we could deal with another think less than 300 miles of wall. And that would really be a, that would be enough to significantly deter the illegal crossings and force them across actual border checkpoints. So, you know, that 5,000 number was a big deal. Now I understand why, because technically right now we don't have to let one person in. So I think that we should be able to shut down the border quicker. The problem is right now it's an executive branch decision. So Biden has loosened those rules. Trump has clamped, clamped down on them during his first term. So what you end up with is this like four years on, four years off, and and these migrants are essentially paying attention. And really, it's not the migrants that are paying attention. It's the cartels who are getting paid to smuggle people across the border because right now people make cartels more money than, like, let's just put it, cartels are not specifically interested in drugs. They are specifically interested in whatever makes them money. So if that's trafficking drugs, they'll do drugs. If that's avocados, they'll do avocados. If it's people, they'll do people. So when we signal that like you're basically going to be able to sneak across the border and then stay here, that gives the cartel the incentive to go like, look, you pay us X amount per person and you get three tries and we're going to get you across the border and then you're you're set. You're in America. The cartel is the ones making this money. It's human trafficking. It's it's dangerous and we are not we are providing the incentives for the cartel to do that we've got to shut down those incentives i don't think this bill does enough to shut down those incentives that would be my biggest problem with it um and part of that is that encounter number it's like i think we should shut down the border right this moment and say hey, we got a we've got a backlog of amnesty stuff we we got to catch up now some of that we are taking care of so um one is that there are um, tougher asylum requirements. You can't just say, oh, I fear for my life. There's a couple of specific things that has to be um, 
checked off. So one of them is that it would have to be, you can't have a criminal history. So we need to be able to check that out. The second thing is that if the person could have settled in a different country on their way here, then we're going to refuse you amnesty uh, or asylum, not amnesty. Sorry. I said amnesty a couple of times. I meant asylum. Sorry. Um, and then um, you also, it, could you have resettled somewhere in your home country other than where you live? So like a different city in that country, for example, if you don't meet those requ requirements, we are not going, we're going to turn you away for asylum because you could have like, for example, someone going to Yem from Yemen to South America, coming up Central America, getting to Mexico and then getting to the US, we're going to say, nah, you could have stopped in Mexico and we're going to refuse them. So that's going to shut down the number of people that are going to be seeking asylum and they're going to know they have to have a legit reason to come in. And then um, it also moves some of those asylum claims away from immigration judges and to the USCIS, which is an agency. And so it'd be some agencies taking care of this, which obviously would be more quickly staffed than judges potentially, because there's a huge backlog on these asylum cases. So, um, and obviously there's more funding for ICE deportation officers and border patrol agents and asylum officers, and it increases the deportation flights. So that's the flights that we take from illegal aliens that are here and we fly them back to Mexico or wherever. And um, it also allows for 50,000 visas over five years. So that would be what Democrats want. And um, unaccompanied minors can't be removed. So that's still a thing too, because that still is a thing that happens where essentially the cartel is smuggling kids. The dangerous thing about that, in my opinion, is that obviously we have no idea if we've got to be able to verify that a kid goes with the people that came with them. And if they're unaccompanied, Obviously, can you imagine being in a situation where you sent your kid on a thousand mile journey to another country to hopefully meet relatives with a cartel stranger? You're paying a cartel member to take your child across the border. How bad does it have to be where you are? So I have real sympathy for these people, but we've got to have a better system for it because A, we're not even doing a very good job of verifying that these kids are who they say they are and that we're actually taking them to family in the United States. For all we know, they could be being trafficked as well, like in the bad way, not in like a, they're trying to get to America to get with family and have a good life. Like the, it could be sexual exploitation, slave labor, all sorts of things that would be bad. So we've got to be, we are responsible to do that. And we've got to do that. I think overall, it sounds like a pretty good compromise with way more Republican gets than Democrat gets, but it's dead on arrival and it, it probably will not pass. It probably won't even go for a vote. And we will be in this exact same situation a year from now, regardless of if Trump or Biden get elected. Obviously, I think Biden has been worse on the border than Trump was. I think Trump had some good policies. I think some of it was pretty ham fisted uh, how he tried to go about it. But but he did uh, he did slow the flow of of the illegal immigration that was coming across the southern border specifically. Now, do I think Trump's idea of like building a wall across the entire southern border of Mexico is a good idea or southern border with Mexico? No, I don't. I don't. I think that that's a waste of money. There's a lot of places where no one, I mean, there's mountains, there's towns, there's all sorts of reasons you can't physically build a wall across the entire southern border. But it's also just not that great of a deterrent when we've got other technological situations and, and, and things that could potentially help with it. So I don't know what all of them are, but most of the smart people I know and read about the border are like, we don't need a border wall on the entire Southern border. Uh, that would be a, a waste of money as, and time. Honestly, we could build, there are sp some specific areas that are really necessary to have a wall. There's others that are not, and we could probably do more with more agents and enforcement than just building a wall that someone can get over. Also, a lot of the overstayed visas, guess how they get here? Via airplane. So it doesn't really matter because you can fly an airplane right over a wall. If you can buy a ticket from Mexico to the United States and then you just don't leave, it's a lot hard. We really don't know who those people are. We got to have a better system the whole immigration and visa system needs to be overhauled, but it's really, really bad right now. But this would be a good first step, but we're not even willing to take the first step. So probably dead on arrival. But the reason I think it matters is because you're going to hear Trump and Biden and Republicans and Democrats talk about the border and Republicans are going to be more likely to call it a crisis. But when they had the chance to do something about it, they chose not to. And instead of incremental improvement, they just said, no, we're going to wait for the perfect immigration bill, which will not 
happen. So this border crisis will continue throughout this year and probably for the next several years, because I don't see that there's going to be another opportunity. Obviously, I can't see into the future, but it's been this decades long thing that hasn't been taken care of. Now, all of a sudden, there was an opportunity where Democrats were having to get on board with it and sign it. Now, maybe, maybe Republicans are right and there's a better deal to be negotiated here, but I doubt it. I do sort of agree with some of the people that are saying, hey, we can get more out of Biden because he will he has to sign anything because this is now a political liability for him. And it's no longer a thing where like he's getting to do the thing that energizes his base. It is weird because there's a split, just like there's a split in the Republican Party of Democrats that are going, this is a problem when you take care of it. This is like suburbanites and, you know, you're more sort of elite Democrats are probably going like, uh, yeah, there's actually some <laughs> there's some merit here that like we need to change something here. Whereas like the far left progressive part of the base obviously wants just amnesty for everyone and open borders and stuff. Joe Biden's trying to walk a line between those two, but there's more people in the camp of something needs to be done about the border. So he's going to sign something. So maybe you can get a better deal. I don't know. I would like to see that they would put some effort into it. But like, to me, it just seems like all politics because Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, claimed that the Senate people that were negotiating this just like locked him out of negotiations, which James Langford said was not true at all, that he um, he had reached out and stayed in communication with him and asked like, hey, do you want to be part of it? They said no. So, you know, I know Mike Johnson's lying about the process having been like the rug pulled out from underneath him. I know that's not true. And because I believe James, I'm just I just believe James Langford over Mike Johnson. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't think that that's a hard call for me to make. And so I just don't trust that this isn't just about appeasing Trump. And I think that's a bad way to do policy is to just like be so scared of one guy that you won't do anything. You won't get any incremental change. You won't get any wins. You won't get any compromise because Trump says you can't. So that's the DOA border deal. I don't anticipate we see much more on that. Um, let's move on to Iran. If you have not been paying attention to the Iran situation, we had um, there. Here's the simplest version of the really complicated situation. After the October 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas, an Iran sponsored terrorist group, they also Iran also sponsors all sorts of little militias or or terrorist groups. So they the Houthis and the Hezbollah and all, there's all they're all over the place. They have really conveniently, you know, there's never this paper trail back to Iran, but it, they are absolutely funded by them, and they're probably even getting specific directions. And sometimes they're more so getting like a do whatever you want, and if you do anything we think we need to rein in, we'll let you know. So that this, specifically after October 7th, there have been an uptick of attacks on U.S. and ally ships in like the Suez Canal region and attacking of just commercial ships as well. So much so that the Suez Canal is essentially like not being used because shipping companies are just going around it and adding weeks to shipping delays. And it's also adding cost to shipping stuff. So if you don't remember a couple years ago, there was a ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal and it kind of like messed up worldwide shipping for a while, okay? And so um, that was just a ship that got ran aground, right? And so there's, this is a totally different situation. This is like ships are getting attacked and boarded by pirates and stuff. And so we're trying to stop that. These are Houthi rebels that are absolutely funded by Iran and they've been sending these drone attacks. And for the most part, we've been intercepting them and they've been attacks on us, but no one's died. But there's been 100, over 165 attacks in the last, since October 7th, okay? So that's a lot of drones and bombs and things like that and weapons shot at US, UK and our allies and commercial ships. Well, finally, one hit a, um, a base and, and killed three US soldiers. So all of a sudden, Biden's got to actually act because Biden's just been like tiptoeing around this. He wants to get back into Iran uh, nuclear deal, which Obama signed, but it wasn't through Congress. So it was just undone by Trump. I don't know why Biden is so stuck on being nice to Iran and he keeps claiming he doesn't want to escalate things. I personally think Iran should be scared of us and not, not escalating with us and not us worrying about escalation with them. Um, but call me crazy. Um, 
I just think Biden's foreign policy has been absolutely terrible. And this is another situation like that. So finally, with U.S. soldiers being killed, they had to do something. And so they've been doing these little ticky tack attacks on like Houthi places, but like never really getting the um, IRGC, which is the group of Iranian National Guard that basically support these groups. Uh, specifically, there's a, I forget the name of it already, but um, there's a specific um, unit of it that does that. And so we've never really attacked them. And so Biden's like, hey, we're going to be attacking you. And they kind of were signaling it for a couple weeks, essentially. And finally, they attacked like 85 um, targeted sites uh, this last week. Uh, but really, we gave the IRGC plenty of heads up where they could get their leadership out of there. We did have some attacks on actual IRGC stuff in other countries like Syria and Iraq, not in Iran. But there's a specific situation where I'm like, I don't really understand why we're doing it this way because uh, essentially we've got, um, we we're giving them a heads up. We're worried about escalation with Iran and we're really not deterring it. The attacks have kept happening and they've claimed that they're going to keep happening. It doesn't seem like there's any pullback from the attacks. So all we're doing is maybe slowing them down with some of these attacks, but we're not deterring the attacks. And I think that's the wrong way to go about it. Again, I'm going to give Trump credit here. He just took out Soleimani, uh, which is an uh, Iranian general, and it was a big deal. But you know what? Iran did not retaliate because... I think they knew that we meant business and like, you can't do this to us. Uh, so that's a good example of like, I think Biden's so worried about retaliation from Iran and Iran's talking a big game as far as like, Hey, if you attack anything that's like sovereign, then we're going to go to war. But you know, we killed Soleimani in Iraq a few years ago. I think it was in Iraq and nothing happened. So I think we should be stronger. I don't think this is a strong enough message. I'm not some like war hawk that wants to go to war with Iran, but I don't think this, I don't think we can just let them keep attacking our, our soldiers. You know, we're putting, we are essentially sending kids who I'm going to call kids because these are the, the three people that died were all in their twenties. Okay. We're sending these 18 to 30 year old young people, soldiers right into harm's way, letting them get attacked and not doing anything about it. I, I think that sounds crazy. You either need to pull everyone out of those regions if you're not going to defend your U.S. assets there or, or defend them. I think those are the two options. Um, the other thing, so this is an interesting one just to note. Uh, like, so what should we do? I'm not some military <laughs> strategist, obviously, uh, if you cannot tell. Uh, I wear hoodies. I'm not, uh, I'm not an ex, uh, not an ex Navy guy. And so I don't know, I'm not a military strategist, but I do, I've read enough to know that like, there's a, there's this ship out there. It's called the Bashad and it's a commercial Iranian <laughs> cargo ship, but really everyone knows and everyone hints at and basically says out loud that it's really an electronic intelligence. Basically it's taking intelligence from Iran and passing along to Houthis and telling them which ships to attack and which ones to not attack. And, and it's basically their, it's, it's their CENTCOM. It's their central command, sort of. But we won't take it out because, you know, there is a difference. Like, right now we're attacking Iran. We're attacking their, like, the Houthis and weapons facilities. And, but none of it's in Iran and none of it is technically Iranian. So, because obviously Iran's not going to come out and be like, hey, that was our weapons facility, uh, you attacked us because they're trying to claim it's not their weapons facility, right? So they can plausible deniability for all these attacks. Um, but this ship is absolutely what is coordinating these attacks. To me, we got to take it out. I understand that that is escalating things for sure, but it's not a Iranian Navy ship. It's an Iranian cargo ship, but we treat the same, we treat things the same way. If you attack a U.S. flagged cargo ship, that's an attack on the U.S., and, and our, our military can respond to that in international waters. So that's what Iran is saying. Basically, if you attack that ship, you're attacking us and a sovereign nation and we'll go to war with you. I think we should call their bluff uh, and potentially take that ship out in some way because these attacks are not going to stop if that ship is still around. And it's, it's basically just hovering in the Red Sea for the last year or south of the Red Sea. And it's always within a couple of miles of where the Houthis happen to attack or board a ship. 
maybe it's a coincidence. It's probably not. And they've been chasing U.S. ships and U.K. ships around the area. And like I, they're coordinating these attacks. I think we got to be way more serious with Iran. I think Iran is scary, but not in the way that like, I don't think like Iran should be scared of us. We shouldn't be scared of them. I don't want to go to war with Iran. I don't want to escalate it, but they're the ones backing terrorist groups and attacking our soldiers. So they've brought this on them. It's not that we just decide to attack Iran. So I think Biden's been weak on Iran. I think it will uh, be another thing that potentially uh, dings him in November because this stuff is going to be serious. Okay. We were like, we're in the middle of, we've got an Israel Gaza conflict. We've got potentially a Chinese Taiwan thing going on. Who's, I mean, obviously they're looking at the Russia Ukraine thing. All of these are geopolitical things. We've got an Iran thing. We've got all these backed rebels. There is turmoil in the Middle East right now. And the next president is probably going to have to deal with it in a serious way. And for all of Trump's supporters that say, hey, at least he never got us in a war and he got us out. Well, great. Presidents don't have that much control over this kind of situation. It's like if if we get attacked, we have to respond. Um, I think Biden doesn't want to be in these wars and Trump doesn't want to be in these wars. And I get that. I don't want to be either. That's not my goal. But if we get attacked, we've got to respond. And I, it feels like neither one of them, although Trump, like I said, he did take out Soleimani and he did some actually some good diplomacy or his staff did or the people he hired in the Middle East. He actually had some good wins there. I think way more than Biden has. And I think Trump has the edge here. But, you know, that's that's going to be a liability for Biden in November is that Trump actually put his money where his mouth is on some of this stuff. And Biden hasn't. I'm not saying we should attack Iran so that Biden can get reelected. I think that would also be crazy. I think that they should just do the right thing when they have the power. So Biden's the president right now. I do not trust him that he's up for it in the next four years. And I don't really trust Trump either. Trump did hire better people for foreign policy. I don't think those people would be in his second administration. So I am concerned about the geopolitical stress that's going on in the Middle East and in Russia, Ukraine, and in Israel, Gaza. I mean, I know that's the Middle East, I guess, still. And China, China and Taiwan. I think that the, pre the next president is absolutely going to have to deal with this stuff. And so that's why I think this matters. It's going to matter 30 days from now. I think it's going to matter two years from now. I don't, I don't see any way that all these conflicts just go away and we go, whew, great. We got out of that. I, I just don't see that happening. So I, I think you need to think about that when you vote for not just the president, but your Congress people and, um, and in anyone else that has control over this stuff, because it will matter. It's going to be, you know, uh, I've got a sister-in-law in the Naval Academy right now. So I think about these things like she's going to be in the Navy in, in a couple years. And um, I don't want her going off to some conflict if we can avoid it, you know, but sometimes that means we got to attack people and show them that like, hey, you can't do this to us. So that's that situation. And then the third thing that is important today that I think is absolutely worth talking about, but is very new news, is that a three-judge D.C. Circuit Court found that Trump can be tried for, um, basically he can be indicted because his lawyers were arguing that a president cannot be uh, criminally charged for something that he was not impeached and removed from office for in Congress. It was a pretty bogus argument, and I don't know why anyone's surprised that it came out like this, but it did just it happen to come down. So, the reason this matters, and I know there's a lot of Trump trial stuff going on, and, and most of it is not worth paying attention to, which is why I don't talk about it very much, but here's the reason it does this time. March was March 4th was supposed to be when Trump's um, federal trial for his January 6th, basically his post-election interference with trying to steal the election, okay? That was supposed to start in March. That was supposed to be the first federal trial that he went, actually for the first any of the criminal trials, because um, all of the other ones are... There's a Georgia criminal case. There's a New York one that's totally bogus. Don't pay any attention to the New York one. It's a sham and it shouldn't exist. And it's honestly been the problem with all of these things. But the Georgia one has been cooperating with like, hey, we'll, we'll coordinate with the federal calendar because we understand that those federal prosecutors need some, you know, their case is important too. And so they've been uh, saying, you guys go first or tell us what to do kind of thing. Well, so that, that federal one was supposed to start in March. It already got delayed because the judge was like, well, we can't possibly make the March deadline when we don't yet know, <laughs> like federal courts have not ruled whether we can even bring the charges yet to Trump or not. Can we even prosecute him for this kind of stuff? Well, now that 
three panel judge our three judge panel has ruled that Trump can stand trial for the things. And specifically what they said was Trump allegedly injected himself into a process in which the president has no role, the counting and certifying of the electoral college votes, thereby undermining constitutionally established procedures and the will of Congress. Trump's stance would collapse our system of separated powers. This is his stance, by the way, saying that presidents can't be tried. Now we do have, not really rules, but the DOJ has rules that says like a sitting president can't be tried for a federal crime. But once he's out of the office, he can be. So anyway, going on, he said, Trump's stance would collapse our system of separated powers by placing the president beyond the reach of all three branches, the opinion reads. Um, presidential immunity, uh, sorry, presidential immunity against federal indictment would mean that as to the president, the Congress could not legislate, the executive could not prosecute, and the judiciary could not review. So they're basically just saying our entire government and set up with the separation of powers would not allow a president to never be criminally prosecuted and just be able to get away with whatever they want. Because Trump was ar literally arguing that the sitting president could order SEAL Team 6 to murder his opponent, to assassinate his opponent, and could not be prosecuted for it if he was not first impeached and removed by Congress. That's a pretty bogus argument. I think there is some stuff in the Constitution basically saying, this is trying to lay out that just because someone is impeached and not removed does, I mean, they, they try to lay out the fact that like, it doesn't have to be connected. Basically, you can still try someone criminally, even if they didn't get impeached and stuff. I think it's pretty clear um, what they were trying to do. But Trump's lawyers are just you know trying to make an argument. And I don't think it worked, obviously. Now, this will get appealed to either another circuit court or potentially directly to the Supreme Court, which keep in mind, the Supreme Court's also going to have to rule on can Trump be on the ballots in Maine and Colorado, which are the two states that have so far removed him from the ballots. Um, you know, the, the primaries for both of those states is Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. And I would assume we'd need to hear something by then, although those states probably don't really matter for Trump's nomination. But it will matter pretty quickly on whether he can be on the general ballot. And that's some of the situations like Maine is saying, well, we can't get involved in the, um, or it wasn't Maine. It was someone else. One of the States basically said, Hey, we, we can't get in the primary deal, but we, Oh, that was Minnesota. Minnesota said, we don't have any control over whether Trump can be on his, on his party's nominee as on the ballot, but we can revisit this if he becomes the nominee to say if he can or can't be on the general ballot in November, because that's really where the state has control. The state doesn't actually have control over the party's nominations. And so that's what Minnesota ruled, but Colorado and Maine both said, no, we can remove him from the primary ballot, basically disqualifying him just like we would disqualify him if he wasn't 35 years old. We would say, well, the Constitution says you can't do that. So they're saying, well, the Constitution says if you're an insurrectionist or rebel against the country, then you can't run for office. So that's what they're saying. Supreme Court's going to have to rule on that. Obviously, that's going to make a huge difference in the election this year. If the Supreme Court comes out and says that Trump can't be on the ballot, uh, that would be a huge thing, right? And obviously, if they say he can be, it's also going to be a huge thing because, um, you know, that's what we're hinging on. And some of this matters because now it looks like because that trial got delayed it, that was supposed to start in March, it's probably going to start in August at the earliest now. That's kind of what people trying to read the tea leaves are saying. Well, obviously, August is after both nominating conventions have happened. So we will have our two nominees and most likely those two will be Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And so is August enough time if, for example, he's tried and found guilty of federal crimes? What do we do at that point? Can we remove him from the ballot? Can we not? Do we elect a, a, a guy that's been convicted of federal crimes? It's all going to get really interesting. And I'm not going to try to speculate on what's going to happen because I don't know. And, uh, but that's the timeline and that's what we got to pay attention to. So hope that helps a little bit. I think that's it for me. That's a lot of stuff that I just talked about. Hope I didn't, uh, blow by any of it too fast. It, we'll, we'll continue to do these kind of things when I think it's important. Um, we'll also just do sort of evergreen topics like we did last week where we talk about, um, sexual abuse uh, by teachers of students in schools. If you didn't listen to that episode, I really highly recommend you do. My guest, Faith Colson, was awesome and an advocate for it. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, do so. Uh, I, I will tend to do more stuff like that that I think is like 
This is a big problem. We're not talking about it enough. We're not solving this problem well enough. And um, generally, it stays evergreen. There's nothing in last week's episode that's going to be outdated, whereas today's might be outdated by next week. We don't really know. So that's the other thing. I'm trying to keep this stuff as fresh, but um, I want it to be potentially important or still relevant a day later, a week later, a month later. And uh, just because I think that if I try to stay on the 24-hour news cycle, it's just too hard. There's just too much stuff. It's a lot of noise that you don't need to pay attention to. And I think we should think it's important that we're good citizens and we stay informed and we vote and we're informed about our vote. But I don't think that means we need to pay attention to politics 24-7. I think it's bad mentally, especially in this culture of, of politics right now. So thanks for joining me. I hope that this is a place that you can get some of that political knowledge and, uh, and discussion without the performative politics and kind of the anger and the outrage and all that kind of stuff that goes along with a lot of political media now. So if you enjoy it, please tell a friend about it. That helps me out a lot. You can rate it on uh, Apple podcast or on Spotify. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube and Instagram. That's where I do most of the kind of social content, leave a comment. Uh, you could say something nice if you wanted to, not necessarily about me, just like to anyone in the comments that that's lacking severely in the comment section. <laughs> so say something nice to someone that'd be nice. And like I said, if you, if you like any of this content, please forward it to someone that you think would also enjoy it. I think there's a lot of people like you and me that don't, we want to be involved, but we hate the current culture of this political stuff. And I, that's how I feel. I just, I'm, I'm more and more homeless. I feel like every, every day that goes by between the two parties and the, and the people that we've elected and the kind of like just body nonsense that's going on all the time and performative stuff that goes on in Congress. And I think a lot of people are. So I hope this is a place that you can feel good about learning about politics. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Tell someone about it. I'll catch you next week.